Hello and welcome to part two of the Maximum Supermac series, where we're taking this lovely G3 upgraded UMAX Supermac S900 from 1996 and seeing just how far we can upgrade it. Now, if you haven't seen the previous episode, I'd recommend starting there. I'll put a link in the description below, but basically we tried to put a gig of RAM in this thing. That didn't work. We tried to upgrade the fan to a modern one and got the wrong one. We couldn't fix the CD-ROM drive, but we got a very nice retrobrite on the original keyboard, so that's very nice. Well, today, let's see if we can get a couple successful upgrades in this thing, because this super interesting Macintosh clone deserves a lot better than this. So stay tuned. But before we jump in today, I'd like to start this episode with an apology. In the previous episode, I was very hard on former Apple CEO Gil Emilio, blaming him for basically steering Apple into a wall in the 90s. Well, Gil Emilio, I am so sorry. I was way too hard on you, and even though nobody really liked you at Apple because you came in and just tried to fire everybody, that was probably the only thing you could have done because Apple was about to implode. And when Steve Jobs came back, he kind of used you as the fall guy, and that is just not your fault. And the real villain of the Apple story, of course, is Michael Spindler, who completely destroyed the company in the earlier part of the 90s with just terrible leadership and horrible business decisions, even though this performer back here is probably my favorite 68K Mac. But anyway, Spindler, it's your fault. Gil Emilio, you're okay. So just like last time, the first thing I want to do is address this fan situation. So if you remember last time, we tried to replace this obnoxiously loud original fan. With a nice quiet Noctua, but what I didn't realize was this little cage bracket thing for the fan is bigger than the mounting point holes would lead you to believe. So right now we just have this 80 millimeter fan uh, screwed into the case, but we're going to put this correct size fan into the bracket. And then this fan is actually going to fit inside this nice bracket. All right, so we actually have to take these little rubber deals off, at least on the top, for it to be able to snap together. Awesome. Factory standard knock to a fan. And then this just slides in nicely in here. And snaps into place. And next I'd like to replace this not working CD-ROM with this nice TX 16 speed SCSI CD-ROM that I picked up. And it said test it working, so I guess we'll find out. All right, so I'm just gonna leave this kind of dangling in here and it's hooked up and we'll see if this actually will read a CD. It's spinning up, that's a good sign. All right. So I've got the UMAX OS8 updater. Let's see if it reads it. Ah, well, that's weird. So it sees that there's a disc in there, but it can't read it. All right, well, maybe it didn't like that disc, so let's try this 922 Universal disc. All 
All right, so CD-ROM Toolkit sees the TAC. Maybe if we just play with some of these settings here. All right, so I just wiped the disc off and put it back in, and now it seems to be working. So I guess this was the equivalent of blowing on a Nintendo cartridge and it working. Although I'm not actually seeing the files on this disk. Well, let's try to start up from it. All right, so I found this old HP DVD SCSI drive, and I'm sure it's not going to work, but hey, why not give it a shot? No, it doesn't even want to open. Well, it's detected, but it says no driver. Device is not recognized. Okay, so here's a crazy idea. I flashed the ISO for the UMAX System 8 installer onto an SD card and put that in the SCSI to SD up here and I just used FWB mounter to mount it. So the only thing is I don't know if we can actually boot from this volume. So let's find out. All right, startup disk sees it. And here goes nothing. And no, it looks like we're just starting off of the hard drive again. So I put the original CD-ROM drive back in here and oh my God, if it did not just decide to boot. So here we are booted into the OS8 install disk and I'm not gonna ask questions, I'm just gonna do it. What? Okay, so I don't know what the deal is here, but when I try to run this installer, I get this, this program cannot run on your computer. See the documentation for more information. So I don't know if this doesn't like the G3 upgrade card or something, but I actually don't have the original processor so what I think I'm going to try, and this might be a horrible idea, I'm just going to install Mac OS 8 from here, and then I'm going to install all of the Super Mac utilities one by one from the CD. All right, we're installing Mac OS 8. All right, we installed. So I guess let's just go for it and reboot and see if it's alive. All right. That certainly looks like OS 8 to me. Yeah, Mac OS 8.0. Okay, so I'm going to say that's successful and we still have all of our other cool stuff installed. So I'm sure it was all the same version of all the Super Mac utilities on that CD. So 
This is as good as the install would have been, I guess, if we had run the full installer. All right, so while we're in here in our nice new OS 8 install, why don't we take some time to poke around and look at some of the cool Super Mac stuff that's installed on here. So through the magic of screen capture, let's zoom in and enhance. All right, so you can already see I've been uh, playing around with some of the installed software, which uh, includes CyberDog, one of the most forgotten web browsers in the history of web browsers. And I've been downloading a lot of stuff through CyberDog. We'll take a look at that in a second. But first, the default Super Mac install comes with this gigantic folder of Super Mac accessories, including some pretty cool stuff. So yeah, we've got Adobe, and we've got this Asante Nick utility stuff, but CD-ROM Toolkit and its partner Hard Drive Toolkit, or Hard Disk Toolkit, is actually some pretty handy stuff. So if we want to check out information about the CD or DVD drive we've got in here, uh, we can do so, but we can also set stuff like whether it's on or off, whether it's in fast mode or whether something's wrong with it and you have to put it into slow mode or something's wrong with the disk. Uh, but you can also set it up and do a lot of cool setup stuff, including messing around with the cache, uh, telling it what to mount. So if I want to make sure it can mount everything possible, I can have all of this stuff selected and that'll make sure that hopefully it'll read even like burn CD-ROMs with the search every track for possible data to mount. You can tell it to read ahead which can speed up applications according to this that make lots of data requests. So you can read ahead to 32K. I don't know why you'd want small versus large, but I'll just leave that. You have a lot of special options, including use the slower pulled non-blind SCSI IO, which is probably if you're using a very finicky CD. And actually I might have to try this on some of the CDs that I couldn't get to mount in here. And similarly interesting is Hard Disk Toolkit, which helps a lot because the disk in here is not actually an Apple disk and it doesn't have an Apple ROM. So the SCSI disk in here is just a third party like off the shelf disk. So Hard Disk Toolkit can help you format it and mount it and do all kinds of stuff. And actually I found this very helpful for the SCSI to SD adapter because it was able to see it and mount it straight away, even though Mac OS 7 didn't see it originally. We've got the Super Mac N Power MP, which stands for, I believe, multiprocessor, uh, which includes all this stuff for third party processor enabling and tweaking. And since we have a Sonnet G3 upgrade in here, it's actually pretty handy. If I can find the correct utility here. I think it's probably easier to find in here. Yeah, N power control. Which is a Daystar digital app, but this can tell us all kinds of stuff about, you know, OS version, memory installed, which that doesn't actually seem right. Okay, yeah, I guess we only have 400 megs installed. I thought we had 512. Huh, that's weird. Oh, I think I took a RAM stick out because I was Googling it and I forgot to put it back in. Ah, oh, well, uh, this can tell us interesting stuff about which RAM sticks are installed. And yes, as you can see, I stupidly forgot to put one of these RAM sticks back in. And I like it's very kind of Star Trek L cars interface. That's very cool. You can tell us about the L2 cache and whether it's on or off. And for some reason it says cache none, but it should be 
cache all, I would assume. And it can tell us what's in our PCI card. So it's a pretty nice little piece of software. We have something called Tech Tool Pro, which I forget exactly what this is offhand. So let's rediscover it together. Ah, so this is a tweak tool, which is licensed to UMAX from Micromat Computer Systems Inc. back in 1997. And we've got a lot of benchmarks and we can do audio tests and desktop integrity, save desktop. Yeah, there's a lot of testing and benchmarks and I don't know what autopilot is, but I don't want to mess with that. I guess that's if you wanted to keep your computer running all the time on some kind of a test or I don't know. I'm not going to touch that. I wonder what these benchmarks are like. Let's see. I have no idea what a whetstone test is, so let's run it. <laughs> All right, test passed, I guess. All right, dry stone test. I wish you could like see the test as it was running. I guess dry stone is a lot more difficult than whetstone. Test passed. <laughs> so we have 876,690.55 dry stones per second. Uh, if you know what that means, let me know in the comments below because I'll probably forget to Google it later. Cycle test. Cycle test appears to be faster. All right, 4,742 cycles per second. And I think these last two are like array sorting, so. All right. It's in these audio tests. Synth sine wave. Sounds like a hearing test. Um, open channel timing. All right, I don't actually hear anything. Uh, stop. All right, that's Tech Tool Pro. Don't save. It's also got Disk Maker in here, which create oh, that creates special floppy disks for the tests in the floppy panel of Tech Tool Pro. Mm, don't need that. And then games is stuff that I brought on here because obviously Wolfenstein 3D is important. Uh, but what's really interesting is CyberDog. So hopefully our network settings have persisted. This version of OpenDoc cannot run under Mac OS 8. Oh man, I can't use CyberDog. All right, well, here is a picture of what CyberDog would look like. And then it also comes with all of these cool gauges. Unknown processor type. <laughs> this software re requires virtual memory. All right, so I guess these gauges don't like the G3 processor. All right, that's not very exciting. And then we have some Daystar performance demos. Let's check those out. Let's do a Mandelbrot. Generation time 0.14 seconds. Seems pretty good. And I guess it just shut the whole thing down, all right. 3D projection. All right, let's try a Julia set. Generation time 0.12 seconds. All 
All right, that's, uh, I don't know what was so 3D projection about that. All right, I think that's a pretty good overview of the cool stuff that's included on our special Super Mac version of OS 8 and the OS 7 uh, installer that came before this. Okay, so I think we're going to have to call part two here on this still a little bit of a disappointing bombshell. Uh, I ordered new memory for this, but it's lost somewhere in New York, I guess. So in the next episode, we'll see if maybe, I don't know, we can even salvage the memory that came with this machine. We'll pet this cat some more and we'll try a couple other things to really bring this machine up into a little bit more of the modern age. I have some ideas here. So if you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe down below. And thank you very much for watching.